January 18th, 2024, the uh, waxing half moon observance day. And thinking about this perception of time, sort of going for two weeks now into our winter retreat period, and we've had full schedule of group practice, full days of group practice, and we'll have one more week of the full group schedule, morning, afternoon, evening, and then we'll open it up a little bit. So until January 25th, we've got a full group schedule and uh, been doing a fair amount of sitting and walking meditation together, and it's been very good. I think it's uh, helped us to get into retreat mode. And this, but this perception of time comes up and time passing, but also historical time. And uh, for me, I, I know at the turn of the millennium, there's this idea of the future and how advanced things are going to be and how amazing the future is going to be and how amazingly technologically advanced everything is going to be and what's going to happen, what's it going to be like. And now I found my perception of the future has changed a little bit because now we are in this kind of future that I perceived 25 years ago or so that it'll be this way or that way or it'll be some sort of hyper advanced where uh, humans will be augmented with robotic brains perhaps or everything controlled by AI. And it might still be that way at some point. But uh, actually, I have this idea now that these times that we're living in now are just no different than any other time in history. We still just need to eat. We need to sleep. We need to just live, do, do basic things to live. And maybe I have this perception now during the winter retreat also just because I had this determination to not use the cell phone or computer at all for three months. And uh, so like a low tech determination and this idea that it's just, things are just ordinary. My eyes feel very good right now. <laughs> no eye strain, <laughs> no uh, screen radiation <laughs> going into the eyes. And it's very helpful for just being less distracted, having less correspondence, less communication, more time for going inward. So many of us have been doing sittings. I've been uh, suitably impressed that some people have been doing long sitting. We're just uh, sitting through most of the, most or all of the morning session and the afternoon practice session. And for myself, I, I get inspired when I think about this sense of yogic sitting or just long practice, many hours of practice each day. And yet it's kind of strange that I find it inspiring because we're just sitting there doing nothing. So we're just, I find this experience of sitting for two hours or three hours at a stretch, it's just, you know, why is it special? Why is it so important to do those kind of things? Because it's just, well, there's just nothing happening. We're just sitting there. We're just sitting there and then thoughts come up into the mind, like passing clouds and the breath comes in, the breath goes out. Sometimes with, sometimes the mind is with the meditation object, sometimes not. Sometimes the mind might drift off into various thought formations and then mindfulness comes back, and back to the meditation object. But it, whatever happens in the meditation, that, that sense of sitting there for a longer period of time, and there's just nothing much happening. Whatever thoughts do come up, at least we're not acting on them. If they're unwholesome, we're not acting on them. If they're wholesome, then we can make much of them and if there are thoughts of goodwill, thoughts of non-harming, thoughts of non-cruelty, those are right thought, that's samasankapa. So 
that's part of the path. So we make much of those. Then I, I found this experience of longer periods of sitting or longer periods of walking. And even if the mind hasn't become very, very concentrated or very, very focused or had some sort of deep state of samadhi in those longer periods, I found that then any time outside of the meditation is far more pleasant and far more stable, far more solid. The mind has seems to have much more of a refuge and much more of a mainstay from those, and it really stems from those long periods of just emptiness that occurs within the long sitting or the long walking meditation. So I think it's very, very good for getting into that sense of being in retreat. And then what comes up from that for myself is this, these original inspirations that brought me to the monastery in the first place. So this ins inspiration to really be more devoted to the practice, this inspiration to be more devoted to cultivating the empty mind and inspiration to be more devoted to virtue, meditation, wisdom. And those inspirations come up in a very fresh way. And so the practice is always refreshed and it never really gets old. Each day it gets refreshed. And, and the mindfulness, with, with mindfulness, there's always grist for the mill, whatever is occurring in the mind. Then we can see it with mindfulness and there's always something to discover. And if there's still any sense of discontent or any sense of clinging or suffering, then there's always something new to discover. Why is that happening? Why is that process still taking place? And so, of course, as we all know, it's not just about meditation. The whole path comes into this, that Abhayagiri is known for as being a very harmonious community. And we lift that up as a, that's a, Longpur Cha standard to try to cultivate this sense of Sangha Samagi or the harmonious community. And we do that through kindness. We try to follow that teaching in the suttas of how does a community become harmonious and uh, specifically the bhikkhu community, how do they become harmonious through having, through doing acts of metta, speech with metta, thoughts of metta towards one's companions in the holy life. So that's acts of goodwill or acts of loving kindness. That's speech imbued with goodwill or love or kind words, kind words, encouraging words to one another. And then also kind thoughts towards one another. So it really, if we look at something like kind thoughts towards one another, that's something we can cultivate in a period of retreat when we're not speaking as much, and we're not engaged in as much physical activity, then we can focus on those kind thoughts and then the thoughts of the root. So if there's thoughts of goodwill, there's gonna be speech and acts of goodwill as well. The mind is the root. Everything follows suit from the mind. So to look at if the judgmental critical mind is arising, these people are talking too much. They're not keeping noble silence. So if those thoughts are arising, to try to look at that and say, well, what is noble silence? Noble silence is when the mind is wholesome. So the unwholesome mind, even though we may not be speaking as much, that's not actually noble silence. If the judgmental critical mind is arising, then that's not what we're aiming at with this idea of noble silence. So if... Uh, if some speech, it, it's, if it's gonna lead to harmony, harmony and a sense of camaraderie in the community, or if it's gonna be encouraging to one another, then that's speech that should be engaged in. That's, that's totally all right. For myself, it, it took me a while to figure that out. You know, uh, at first as a, coming in as a sincere, wanting to be a very sincere practitioner, and I, was, uh, I just remember being very critical of others. And so it took me a while to figure out that that wasn't the correct way to go about things. And it certainly wasn't the way of non-suffering. <laughs> if we look at things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, then 
when we have the judgmental critical mind that's suffering here and now, it's, it, we can see that it's dukkha now. So the moment we have that judgmental critical mind, that is suffering right then and there. Uh, so that's, we can actually gain insight at that, at that moment in time. We can see, that, oh, this is suffering. All right. So the Buddha wanted us to stop suffering. So maybe to stop suffering, maybe I need to stop thinking like that. How do I do that? That's our contemplation. We find we have to find creative ways within our character, within our temperament. We find creative ways to actually call into question and go against ways of thinking that are causing us suffering. And when we actually are able to overcome those ways of thinking that cause us suffering, then the ways of speaking and acting that cause suffering, those will get better as well, because the, the mind is the root. Everything follows from the mind. Sometimes it's interesting to think about how, how we might be viewed from, uh, from the outside, from people who maybe don't know about the Buddha's teachings or haven't really been inspired by the Buddha's teachings or follows, followers of other religions might not understand why do why do we need to wear robes, shave our heads, uh, live in such a way, follow these precepts? Seen from an external perspective, it might seem strange or that uh, this is some sort of cult or that uh, it's just some sort of fringe group that uh, has turned their back on society and wants to just get away from everything and so uh, but then when I think about from my own my own inspiration or my own perspective of the way I view what we're doing here it's completely different than that and that there's this these incredibly inspiring teachers like Lumpur Cha or or Lumpu Man and all of the inspiring teachers that have practiced and actually verified the Buddha's teachings for themselves. So when we come to ordain and we, we come to commit our entire lives to these teachings and trying to follow and realize and actualize all these teachings of the Buddha, uh, we're really going by past practitioners who have actually verified these things for themselves. So it's the Buddha's teachings and the reality of the Dhamma, it's not just hearsay, it's not just some fanciful notion, it's not just some interesting thing to think about or ponder, it's not just some sort of philosophy that uh, is extremely fun and interesting to think about, but it's actually uh, true and verifiable practice leading to complete freedom and liberation of the heart that ha actually has been verified by past practitioners stemming from the Buddha himself and on through the ages and actually having been verified by practitioners up to the present who have been able to see for themselves through their own ardent and, and pre ardent practice and overcoming their own obstacles and then they're able to share those, the fruits of their practice with us. And they're able to give us that message that yes, even for you, it's possible. And for anybody who practices to actualize and realize the Noble Eightfold Path and be liberated from suffering is actually possible. And it's not just hearsay. It's not just something that, uh, that is some sort of fairy tale, but it is actually possible. So, uh, so for myself during winter retreat, I tend to get re-inspired by these types of teachings and these types of reflections that uh, come up into the empty mind as, as we do the longer periods of sitting and walking meditation. So we're doing these uh, lunar observance days. Of course, during the pandemic period, we eased off maybe even before that actually we eased off with uh, following them as the community has grown it's uh, it's become more 
difficult to actually follow these on a regular basis. I know when I first came here, Ajahn Pasano and Ajahn Amaro were leading the way, holding the torch, the uh, lunar observance days every week, the full moon, the new moon, and these half moons. They were, uh, it was everybody in the community was uh, staying up for those vigils every time not just during the winter retreat, but also the uh, normal part of the year. And so that was very much this very strong pulse, the early days at Abayagiri. And then over time, the community has grown. And uh, now it's been, especially during the pandemic, we eased off quite a bit, wanting people to look after their immune systems as much as possible and not push things too hard. And and then to uh, to try to get back to something like this is is difficult, especially when the community is bigger and and then things are happening on the day after Wan Pra, the day after the lunar observance days. It's like if people are driving, we don't want them to be sleep deprived when they're driving. It's uh, remembering the early days at Abayakiri, we had someone a uh, sleep deprived Anagarika drive off the road um, coming down the coming down the hill and so uh, I was think okay well it'll be optional for if somebody's driving there's doctor's appointments bigger community there's there's tends to be things happening on the day after the observance day so okay we'll make it optional this day or we'll make it optional that day so it's it is does end up getting harder to get back into it one because we uh, we let go of it largely during the pandemic period and then also because of the bigger community and our community is aging so there's more doctor visits and so it's uh but during the winter retreat i found we might be able to get back to this so uh so then uh, reinstating that i that doing it every every week and trying that out and it is very much one of the hallmarks of the ajahn cha tradition and Ajahn Shah gave a lot of importance to staying up on the observance day. Of course, after Wat Papang grew and changed over the years and became such a big community that um, it wasn't really enforced, but anybody, there was always kind of a core group staying up every week. And some of these monks who have just been, they've been there for 30, 40 years, and they've just lived at Watpapong and done that practice the whole time. And you can see the development of it over that very strong ethos of practice coming out of Watpapong. And so, uh, but then, uh, yeah, we'll see, uh, see how it goes. So it's, it's not quite like Watpapong here where at Watpapong, they, they tend to have a normal day the day after one pra is just another normal day. So they just go about their work. They just go about things uh, on the day after one pra. Here we actually have a clear rest day, which is very nice. And, and I think it is useful to have that and necessary. So we can use the winter retreat period to get re-inspired by practice. And the theme is back to the basics. So these... Uh, looking into the Four Noble Truths, Noble Eightfold Path, Anapanasati, and these basic practices that we do all the time that we focus on as much as possible, even outside of the winter retreat, morning and evening puja. We do our chanting and meditation on a daily basis. On the winter retreat, we have that opportunity to become a bit more focused on these things and re-inspire ourselves with these things and to really uh, let go of the world, at least temporarily. So uh, it's another benefit I found of, of uh, letting go of the phone and the computer for a period of time is just not seeing, even even if I don't check it, it, it like the little news feed on the, on the side might come up, and kind of the attention going there, noticing things and uh, just not really knowing, uh, I figure if there's some giant 
world changing event or really big news, somebody will tell me about it. Some I'll hear about it somehow. Don't have to be plugged in for that. But this idea that the mind really tends to go out to these things and it'll, there's always something to be worried about. There's always something to be fearful of. Uh, there's always something to be concerned about in the external world. And then to really have these things in place to be able to really go inward. And I remember uh, in 2017, getting ready to do a period of retreat for my 15th Vasa. I was going to be in retreat for the whole Vasa in Jangwat Nan in the north of Thailand and had this opportunity to be in a solitary retreat kuti. And I remember taking leave of Lung Pao Liam. And uh, because I'd been helping out at Wat Pananachat, I'd been helping look after the place with uh, Ajahn Kevali and uh, was kind of his helper during that time. I was, had spent my 14th Vasa at Wat Pananachat and helped look after the place when Ajahn Kevali was traveling. And, and uh, so I had a, did have a cell phone at that time. And then when I was going to go on retreat, I was taking leave of Lung Paliam and he said, are you really going to be in solitude if you have that thing with you? And uh, I thought, well, maybe not. <laughs> and, uh, and then he said, I don't have a phone and I'm more peaceful. So I said, yeah, you're more peaceful. <laughs> I know you're more peaceful than me. <laughs> He's like, I don't have a phone and I'm more peaceful. <laughs> So uh, I did end up giving it up at that time. And, uh, you know, because it, it's a lot of perceived conveniences that come about from, from having a cell phone. And when giving it up is an interesting experience because then uh, I, uh, I left the phone at Wapananachat and then got on a plane to uh, Jungwat Nan, Nan province. And it's a very small airport there. And then uh, there was supposed to be a car coming to receive me from this uh, monastery there, uh, branch number 99 of Wat Papong. We have uh, this uh, monk named Ajahn Narate. He's got about 36 vases now, I think. And um, they were supposed to come pick me up. And then I was going to stay there for a night or two and then actually go to this retreat kuti that was uh, get driven from this monastery to this retreat kuti I was going to be in. So uh, I got to the airport and there was just nobody there to receive me. And I kind of reached for the phone and, oh, I don't have, don't have this. What, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And uh, so I, I had never been there before, so I just didn't really know where to go. And I had a suitcase with me and and then it got dark and then they closed the doors of the airport and locked them. And then I was just standing there by myself, not really knowing what to do. I had this suitcase with me. Well, what do I just start walking? I don't know what direction to go. I don't know where this place is. I don't have the address or anything. And so uh, then there was, I, I saw that there was this other guy standing kind of, uh, kind of far away and a car came to receive him and these people got out and said, "Oh, well, monk, uh, yeah, can we uh, can we help you? Or where are you going?" And I said, "Well, I think there was this car from this monastery that uh, was supposed to get me, and I think they just forgot or something." And it was actually, I hadn't personally worked this out. It was somebody else, another another monk, had worked this out for me and told me that there was going to be a car. So I didn't really know what was happening, and. Uh, then uh, he said, oh, well, where are you going? I said, oh, there's this monk at this one monastery. I was supposed to go there. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we know that monastery. We'll take you there. So I uh, made a connection with these people. They took me to the monastery. And so I showed up and met with the abbot and said, oh, uh, a Western monk. And, and talked with him, chatted with him for a while. And those lay people took their leave, but then they gave me their kind of information and then they offered to take me these lay people actually offered to take me to the retreat kuti which was quite a ways away from this monastery so through not having a phone I actually made a new connection 
with these people who ended up kind of looking after me this whole retreat. Anytime I needed to go anywhere, I could actually have this uh, ranger who was helping look after me because it was on the edge of, nas- of a national park. He could call these lay people and they would actually offer rides to me. So so it was, uh, at first it kind of seemed like, oh, you know, why did I give up the phone? And then it actually this lovely relationship came about just because of not having a phone. And uh, so anyway, I was at uh, Ajahn Arate's monastery and forget the name of the place, of the monastery, but uh, he was like, oh, so you're going to go on retreat or something? I said, yeah. I said, uh, did, did anybody ask you or was there supposed to be a ride for me or something? And he's like, oh, well, let me check. And he looked at his calendar and he's, oh, I'm so sorry. It's here. Yeah, I've totally forgot. So, so he did have it in his calendar, but uh, it just got overlooked. But, uh, but yeah, then these people were able to give me a ride to Khun Satan uh, so by another province called Pra, and uh, where they were able to take me to this to this retreat Kuti, and then it was ended up being a very good experience um, to be uh, out of touch for a while. And then at the end of the Vasa, these same people actually drove me all the way to Anandagiri, where I was going for the Katina. And uh, it was about a six or a seven hour drive from where I was. So, uh, so yeah, it was, uh, and then that's the last time I saw them. But through the whole Vasa, that whole period, I had this connection with these, these lay people. So that sense of being able to leave the world behind, at least temporarily, and there's always going to be, there's always going to be wars in the world. There's always going to be difficulties, conflicts. So going back to this sense of historically, things are just kind of the same as they've they've always been. Perhaps it's a bit more fearsome now because of because of technology. There's that the threat of nuclear war or a, a nuclear exchange, which is that much more fearful but it's still just people people living and dying and uh, we can bring that back into our contemplation there's always going to be fights in the world there's always going to be people who have wealth there's always going to be poor people there's always going to be people who are uh, physically have a lot more suffering and people who physically have less suffering and there's always going to be uh, people who are trying to, uh, uh, people who are unvirtuous, and then people who are trying to practice virtue. So really what we're trying to do here is no different than what was happening in the time of the Buddha. We still have this opportunity to practice virtue. We still have this opportunity to meditate. We still have this opportunity to develop wisdom and use the time well. And I remember it's like thinking uh, about that teaching of Lumpur Cha from a still forest pool. You know, why not step over here where it's cool out of the battle? Do you dare to actually not engage with it? Can we actually disengage? And for myself, I think that's the very best thing we can be doing for the world, actually tipping the scales in the direction of virtue, meditation, wisdom. You know, when we cultivate ourselves, we're actually adding a little bit. We're adding some drops in the bucket to the good energy in the world. So rather than going out and battling against all the bad energy, because that sense of fighting or battling is actually adding to it, uh, Master Xuan Hua would talk about this, that when we protest war, we have to be caref- careful that we don't create another war. Because even though... On the surface, it looks like we're doing something righteous. We're actually, through anger, adding to the, you could think of it as the pot of anger energy in the world. We're actually adding to that. So we have to be careful. But through the practices of disengaging and practicing goodwill, thoughts of goodwill, speech imbued with goodwill, actions imbued with goodwill, certainly we're tipping the scales in the other direction. That's what we want to be doing. 
So, uh, and we're only really just over two weeks into the winter retreat period and we have a three months. So we do have a big chunk of time ahead of us, but in the big scheme of things, it is very, very short period of time. So to just create those intentions now to use the time well, we have another week of full group practice coming up. And then after that, it'll open up a little bit more, but just to whatever the schedule is during this three months to really uh, try to cultivate those thoughts of goodwill, use the time well, uh, help each other out, cultivate kindness, cultivate patience. Uh, reading this book of Lung Poro Pot, uh, Lung Poro Pot is talking about how communal harmony is created through two qualities and that's loving kindness and patience. And really, if we're not patient, there's actually no metta. There's, there's no goodwill if we're not able to be patient. So patience and kanti and metta actually go together as two qualities, which are creators of communal harmony. So to really focus on those qualities and back to the basics, the Four Noble Truths, Noble Eightfold Path, uh, getting it re-inspired by practice, re-inspired by uh, that sense of creating and uh, building up the empty mind, the uh, the samadhi, and uh, doing large amounts of sitting and walking meditation. In addition to looking after the facilities, cultivating a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning and and joy within these things. So I think I'll leave that there for this evening. I've probably said enough now for this evening. <laughs>